2 Samuel chapter 12. Today's message is entitled, A Man After God's Own Heart. Leading up to this passage in 2 Samuel chapter 12, um, we pick up this story immediately following King David's sin with Bathsheba. At this time, David is king over all of Israel. He's already defeated Goliath. And God has given David victory over all of his enemies and all of the surrounding territories around Israel. They are winning every single battle. And then in 1 Samuel chapter 11, David makes a series of sinful choices. First, David chose to remain home when he was supposed to be out at battle. In 2 Samuel chapter 11, verse 1, it says, It happened in the spring of the year, at the time when kings go out to battle, that David sent Joab and his servants with him, and all Israel. And they destroyed the people of Ammon and besieged Rabbah, but David remained at Jerusalem. David was supposed to be leading, leading his people in battle, but instead he chose to remain at home. He, perhaps he thought, well, we're winning. We're doing great. This is easy. God's blessing us, so I'm just going to you know, take a vacation. I'm just going to rest at home. And because he chose that, he was not busy in the things that the Lord had called him to do. He allowed himself this time of temptation. Then while David was home, walking on his rooftop, he spied a woman bathing. Then he inquired about her to find out who she was. When the news came back, he found out that this was Uriah's wife, Bathsheba. Uriah was one of the top 40 men in all of David's army, one of David's mighty men. He was a friend of David's, and this was his wife. And yet, despite knowing this, David had her, Bathsheba, brought to him, and he commits adultery with her. Then Bathsheba, she sends word to King David and says, um, David, I'm pregnant. And my husband has been away at battle. You know, the battle you're supposed to be leading. He's been away this whole time. And so David, he brings Uriah back home, calls him home, and he tries to get Uriah to take a little vacation so that they can blame the child on Uriah. Oh, that's just his son. But long story short, it doesn't work out. And so David, trying to cover up his tracks, he sends Uriah back out to battle with a message that tells Joab, the commander of the army, to get close to the enemy, way too close to the enemy, and put Uriah on the front lines, and then everybody pull back and leave Uriah alone on the front lines of the enemy, and he's killed. And so David orchestrates this so that Uriah is murdered, but it looks like an accident. After all of this, David finally takes Bathsheba, and he marries her. Instead of David looking like a cheating, adulterous, deceitful, selfish murderer, David now looks like a friend of Uriah, who was killed in battle, and his poor wife was left all alone. And so here's King David, so compassionate, taking in this poor widow into his home to love her and take care of her. But we read at the end of chapter 11, in verses 26 and 27, when the wife of Uriah heard that Uriah, her husband, was dead, she mourned for her husband. And when her mourning was over, David sent and brought her to his house, and she became his wife and bore him a son. But the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. David thought his sin was well hidden. Perhaps he thought he got away with it. He pulled it off. He's in the clear. But David's sin had displeased the Lord. And with that, we pick up now in 2 Samuel chapter 12, in verses 1 through 6, David passes judgment. 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 1, it says, Then the Lord sent Nathan to David. God sends Nathan the prophet to call out David's sin. God says in Revelation chapter 3, verse 19, As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore, be zealous and repent. You see, God does not only hate sin, but he also loves sinners. And because God loves David, God is going to send Nathan to rebuke him, to call out his sin. God loves David too much to leave David in the place that he's at, the place of brokenness and deceit and wickedness. And so God sends Nathan the prophet so that David can ultimately be rebuked and restored. Verse 1 again, Then the Lord sent Nathan to David. And he came to him and said to him, There were two men in one city, one rich and the other poor. The rich man had exceedingly many flocks and herds, 
But the poor man had nothing except one little ewe lamb, which he had brought, had bought and nourished, and it grew up together with him and with his children. It ate of his own food and drank from his own cup and lay in his bosom, and it was like a daughter to him. Obviously, this poor man, he only had that one little lamb. That was the only animal he had, and he loved it. He took care of it. Verse 4, And a traveler came to the rich man, who refused to take from his own flock and from his own herd to prepare one for the wayfaring man who had come to him. But he took the poor man's lamb and prepared it for the man who had come to him. The rich man was obviously rich. He had multiple herds, not just multiple sheep, but multiple herds of sheep, and yet he was selfish. He said, I don't want to lose one of my sheep to feed this traveler, so I'm going to take the poor man's lamb and feed that to the traveler. And so he steals the beloved lamb and he feeds it to this traveler. Verse 5, so David's anger was greatly aroused against the man. And he said to Nathan, as the Lord lives, the man who has done this shall surely die. And he shall restore fourfold for the lamb because he did this thing and because he had no pity. David rightfully saw the wickedness of this rich man. He recognized that it was theft that it was awful for this rich man to steal from the poor man, especially when the rich man had so much. He didn't need to steal from the poor man, but he did because he was selfish. He only cared about himself. And so David's response was harsh. Yes, he needs to give four lambs to the poor man, but this rich man also needs to die. He needs to die because of his great sin. Now in verses 7 through 12, we read about David the man in the mirror. Verse 7, it says, Then Nathan said to David, You are the man. Suddenly David's eyes are opened. Suddenly David realizes that he is the rich man in this story, that he has stolen the wife of Uriah, his friend, the poor man, who only had one wife. David had multiple wives already. David had already been breaking God's laws. And yet here, David chose to do what he wanted, only caring about himself. David found it easy to justify his own sin. Perhaps saying, this is what all the kings do. Perhaps saying, everybody else in the Canaanites are doing this. It's culturally acceptable. It's okay for me to do this. And yet David's sin was great before the Lord. When David hears this story of the rich man and the poor man, he can see clearly, oh, that rich man, he is wicked. He needs to die. We need to put him to death. How interesting that when David saw his own sin on somebody else, he was quick to judge, ready to judge. But when he saw his own sin on himself, he was quick to find mercy and grace and excuses. Oh, it's not really that bad. I didn't do that much. You know, it was the Ammonites that killed Uriah after all justifying his actions, justifying his own wicked heart. Sometimes we judge others for the exact same sin that we struggle with. Jesus teaches us in Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 through 5. He says, Judge not that you be not judged. For with what judgment you judge, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. Jesus is not telling us that we are never to judge others, but he's saying that when we judge, however harshly or graciously we judge others, we're going to receive that same judgment back on ourselves. Often, we have one set of standards for other people that's harsh. There's no leeway. And we have a completely different set of standards for ourselves so that when we mess up, we say, oh, but it wasn't that big of a deal. I don't know about you, but that's my heart. I've got to catch myself because it's easier for me to judge others but make excuses for myself. Jesus continues in verse 3, and he says, And why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, but do not consider the plank in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, Let me remove the speck from your eye, and look, a plank is in your eye? Hypocrite, first remove the plank from your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. 
Jesus tells us that when we judge others, we need to judge ourselves first. Judge ourselves first. That way we're not going to be hypocritical. We're not going to be like the man who says, oh, I see a speck of sawdust in your eye. Here, let me help. But we have a beam. That's what that word means in the Greek. That, that plank literally means a beam in our eye. I hope your eye doctor doesn't have a beam in his eye when he's trying to help you out. That would be bad. And so we need to judge ourselves first. Make sure we are able to clearly see we judge our own sin before we look at others. Otherwise, we're going to be guilty of what David has done here in passing on judgment on others but neglecting to judge himself, David being the hypocrite. Now, because I'm a pastor, you may not know this, but I'm perfect. I never, I never sin. Whenever my wife and I... Um, you know, get in in fights, it's just hypothetical. We're just practicing so that, you know. But man, I tell you, every time that we might have some disagreement, if I read through 1 Corinthians chapter 13, every single time, I see how I have failed. I see how I am guilty of failing to love my wife in some way or another. And in, in many ways, I just hate that passage. <laughs> because it's so convicting. I can read through it and look at any person in my life and see, yeah, I've, I've, I've not lived up to this passage, not lived up to what it commands me to do in loving these people, especially my wife. And so again, learning to judge ourselves before we pass judgment on others. Now, back in our story here, the Lord shows David himself in a mirror, saying, David, you are the man. You are the rich man. You are the thief. You are the wicked, dirty, rotten sinner that you've just pronounced the death sentence on. And so again, verse 7, Then Nathan said to David, You are the man. Thus says the Lord God of Israel, I anointed you king over Israel, and I delivered you from the hand of Saul. I gave you your master's house and your master's wives into your keeping and gave you the house of Israel and Judah. And if that had been too little, I also would have given you much more. God had to remind David of all of the blessings that he'd given him. Remind David of all of the things God had done for David. Apparently, David forgot. It seems that remembering God's blessings in our life is a great help when it comes to fighting temptation. Think of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. Satan's questions were, did God really say you can't eat of that fruit? Hmm. I wonder why God's holding out on you. Let's focus in on the one thing that God has not given you. Forget, forget everything else. Forget the rest of the garden. Forget, you know, all of the, the beautiful animals and, and the creation you're in. Forget that you get to walk with the Lord every night in the cool of the day. Just focus on the thing that he's not given you. Hmm, wonder why he hasn't given you that. And Eve gave in to the temptation, and so did Adam. I think if you and I had a thankful heart, a heart that remembered God's blessings in our lives, a heart that focused on all that God has done for us, all that God has promised in our future, then when that time of temptation comes, we're going to remember, no, I can't do this. Look at all that God has done for me. Look at how he's blessed me. But we don't want to wait until the time of temptation where we say, oh, wait, i got to be thankful. What has God done for me? We've got to be prepared now. Have a heart of gratitude now so that when the temptation comes, we're ready. Now, amazingly, God told David that he would have given him even more things, more blessings in his life if that had not been enough. God is essentially saying, David, if you needed more, you could have come to me and I would have given you more fulfillment, more contentment in your life. But David didn't go to the Lord. David went to Bathsheba. David went to his flesh. David went to the world to be fulfilled, to be satisfied. And that was the big problem. Verse 9, God says through Nathan, Why have you despised the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight? You have killed Uriah the Hittite with the sword. You have taken his wife to be your wife and have killed him with the sword of the people of Ammon. Did you notice in verse 9 that the Lord says, Why did you do this evil in his sight, in the Lord's sight? Remember all of the things that David tried to do to hide his sin, to keep it secret? And yet God says, you did it in my sight. 
It's like if you have maybe your child when they were young, they're trying to be tricky and deceitful and you're watching them and you know exactly what they're doing. <laughs> they don't know how to, how to be smart enough to think, okay, what does this look like from mommy and daddy's perspective? Oh, they can see me stealing the cookies from the pantry or whatever it is. I remember being a toddler and I snuck into the kitchen and I got those, that box of cheese balls and I snuck back in and I sat on the couch. My babysitter was right there and when she wasn't looking, I'd... <laughs> you know, just the worst sneaky thief I could ever be. I didn't get away with it, by the way. But neither did David. Whenever we sin, no matter how sneaky we think we're being, the Lord says, I I see you. (laughs) There's no hiding from the Lord. Look at verse 10. Now, therefore, the sword shall never depart from your house because you have despised me and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. Thus says the Lord, behold, I will raise up adversity against you from your own house, and I will take your wives before your eyes and give them to your neighbor, and he shall lie with your wives in the sight of this son. For you did it secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel, before the son. This is David's punishment, the consequences for his sin, that first of all, the sword would not depart from his house that within his own family, among his own sons, there would be treachery, deceit, even murder. Also, that his own wives would be taken from him and raped publicly. As he committed adultery with Bathsheba secretly, his wives would be taken publicly. Now in verses 13 through 23, we read how the child dies. Verse 13, it says, So David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. God has just told David that his own family is going to suffer, that the sword will not depart from his home, that his own wives will be stolen from him, and yet David says, I have sinned against the Lord. David had sinned against Bathsheba. He'd sinned against Uriah, yes, but David recognized that above all, he had sinned against the Lord. One of my favorite things about David is that he repented because he recognized he sinned against God, unlike King Saul, who only repented because he didn't want to be punished. You may remember the story when God sent King Saul to destroy the Amalekites. God told Saul, destroy all of them. Don't leave any of them alive. Even kill their livestock. Take them out. And so Saul leads the armies of Israel, and they conquer the Amalekites, but they keep all the best livestock alive. And they even leave King Agag, the king of the Amalekites, alive. And so God sends the prophet Samuel. And Samuel says, Saul, what are you doing? And Saul says, oh, blessed are you in the name of the Lord. Don't you love that? Saul knew the lingo. He knew how he could, you know, oh, I'm I'm doing great. How are you? What's going on? God bless. Praise the Lord. Samuel said, Saul, why didn't you listen and obey the Lord? And Saul said, but I did listen. Look, look at all those dead bodies. We've killed most of the Amalekites. We've killed most of the livestock. And Samuel said, no, but you were supposed to kill it all, not leave any alive. And Saul said, well, it was the people, you know, those Israelites, those dirty, rotten scoundrels, you know, they didn't want to listen to the Lord, and they saw all those livestock, and they said, man, these are some great, healthy sheep. We should keep these. We should put them in our backyard. And so, you know, it was the people's fault. Remember, Saul's the king. He's the one that tells people what to do. And so he's blaming the people. And finally, God says through Samuel, no, you've, you've been disobedient. You've not obeyed me. Partial obedience is disobedience. And so... The Lord said, Saul, I'm going to take the kingdom away from you, and I'm going to make a new king over Israel. Oh, suddenly Saul, he was on his knees. Suddenly Saul, he was weeping. Suddenly Saul was crying out, no, I've sinned. Please forgive me. Have mercy. You see, Saul didn't want to be punished for his sin. He could care less that he sinned against the Lord. David could care less that he was being punished. He cared that he sinned against the Lord. To me, That's one of the greatest reasons of why David was called a man after God's own heart. I want to be like David, recognizing and hating my sin because I've sinned against God, 
not because of the punishments and results and consequences that may come as a result of my own sin. Look at verse 13. Again, so David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said to David, the Lord also has put away your sin. You shall not die. Remember the death sentence that David pronounced upon the rich man, upon himself? God says to Nathan, it's okay, David. I've put away your sin. You will not die. God can only do this because he took the punishment upon himself for the sins of the world. When he died on that cross, he paid for everyone's sin so that if we put our faith in Jesus, then our sins have been paid for. We are made righteous in his sight. Look at verse 14. However, because by this deed you have given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme, the child also who was born to you shall surely die. You see, David was supposed to be different than all of the pagan kings around him. He wasn't supposed to steal wives, commit adultery, murder. That's what the pagan kings did. He was supposed to be different. But because he was the same, he brought dishonor to the Lord. He gave opportunity for the other nations to blaspheme the Lord. And that's what you and I do when we sin. As Christians, we tell the world, oh, we're, we're no different. We're the same. And we give opportunity for the world to blaspheme the Lord. That's why we need Jesus. We need to make sure the world knows, yes, I am no different from you. I'm a dirty, rotten sinner just like you. But I've believed in Jesus. He's made all the difference. He's paid for my sins. And he's helping me fight against my sin now. Verse 15 Oh, Nathan had explained that this child born from Bathsheba and David's adultery, this child would die. And so in verse 15, it says, Then Nathan departed to his house, and the Lord struck the child that Uriah's wife bore to David, and it became ill. David therefore pleaded with God for the child, and David fasted and went in and lay all night on the ground. So the elders of his house arose and went to him to raise him up from the ground, but he would not, nor did he eat food with them. Then on the seventh day, it came to pass that the child died. God said the child would die, but David still prayed and fasted, seeking God to have mercy. He prayed and fasted on the ground for seven days, and the child still died. A reminder for us that though we may pray and fast, we may be sincere, Sometimes the Lord's still going to do what he wants to. Just because we pray and fast doesn't mean we're going to get our own desires. Look at verse 18. Then on the seventh day it came to pass that the child died, and the servants of David were afraid to tell him that the child was dead. For they said, Indeed, while the child was alive, we spoke to him, and he would not heed our voice. How can we tell him the child is dead? He may do some harm. When David saw that his servants were whispering, David perceived that the child was dead. Therefore, David said to his servants, Is the child dead? And they said, He is dead. So David arose from the ground. He washed and anointed himself, and he changed his clothes, and he went into the house of the Lord and worshipped. Worshipped. God did not give David what he wanted. God did not give David what he was seeking, what he was requesting for a whole week of prayer and fasting. And at the end of it, David goes in to the house of the Lord and he worships. Essentially, David was saying, okay, Lord, I sought what I wanted, but I trust your will is better. It reminds us of Jesus' heart in Gethsemane. Lord, not my will be done, but yours be done. And so David's humility willingness to accept the will of God in his life, even when he doesn't like it. He doesn't want it. Verse 20 continues, Then he went to his own house after he worshipped, and when he requested, uh, they set food before him, and he ate. Then his servant said to him, What is this that you have done? You fasted and wept for the child while he was alive. But when the child died, you arose and ate food. And he said, While the child was alive, I fasted and wept. For I said, who can tell whether the Lord will be gracious to me, that the child may live? But now he is dead. Why should I fast? Can I bring him back again? 
I shall go to him, but he shall not return to me. Notice David's confidence here that he would see this child in heaven. He will not come to me, but I will go to him. David had confidence that this little baby that had died would be in heaven and David would get to see him. This is a passage that indicates that unborn and young children that die go to heaven. But it's not because they're without sin. It's not because they're holy and righteous. You see, the Bible tells us that we are all sinners, even from our conception. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 3, speaking about us before we believed in Jesus, it says, "...among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others." You see, when we are conceived and we are born, we inherit our nature of wrath, our nature of sin. We're born guilty before the Lord. And so the only way that anybody gets to heaven is by believing in Jesus. It's not by being perfect. It's not by being more good than bad. It's only by receiving God's mercy. And therefore, even this young child by David and Bathsheba went to heaven because the Lord is merciful and gracious. In verses 24 and 25, we read how Solomon is born. Verse 24, it says, Then David comforted Bathsheba his wife and went into her and lay with her. So she bore a son, and he called his name Solomon. Now the Lord loved him, and he sent word by the hand of Nathan the prophet, and so he called his name Jedidiah because of the Lord. Solomon was given two names. Solomon means peace. Jedidiah means beloved of the Lord. Think about that. God sends Nathan the prophet just to give Solomon an extra name that means, I love you. You might say, but this relationship began in, in sin and adultery and wickedness and deceit. But this relationship was not God glorifying. Why would the Lord give Solomon this great name? Why would the Lord love Solomon? God would say, because I've washed them, I've cleansed them. I've taken what was impure, what was unholy, what was unrighteous, what was wicked and awful, and I've cleansed it. I've made it righteous. I've made it whole. I've made it good. This is another example of how God can take any of us, any of our situations, no matter where we're at, and he can wash us. He can cleanse us. He can make us whole and pure and good. He can take relationships that began in sin, and he can make them holy. He can make them good, and he will even bless them, not because we deserve it, but because he is good, because of who he is. Solomon here would become the next king of Israel. David's relationship with Bathsheba is now blessed. Notice that God is no longer calling Bathsheba the wife of Uriah. He's calling her Bathsheba now, because now the sin's been paid for. It's been put away. David's sin has been forgiven, but the consequences were still to come. David would ultimately lose four of his sons. The first one has already been lost, this, this young baby from Bathsheba and David. David's son Amnon would be murdered by his half-brother Absalom. Absalom would be murdered or were kill, would be killed by David's commanding officer. And Adonijah would be executed for treason. Although David was forgiven, his sin still caused great pain in his life. We can imagine that as David was on that rooftop, thinking about what he wants to do, perhaps he counted the cost. My sin might cost me this much. I think it cost him much more than he wagered. I think that's true for each of us. When we evaluate, what is this sin going to cost me in my life? We never realize how great it will cost us. David is the only man in the Bible that is referred to as a man after God's own heart. But David was not a man after God's own heart because he was righteous, because he never sinned. David was a man after God's own heart because of how David ultimately responded to his sin. I think when it comes to our sin, we have three choices in general. First, we can hide our sin as David did, 
Cover our tracks. Don't let anybody know. Make sure it's secret. Don't let anybody find out. We can try to hide it. The second thing we can do is we can judge others instead. It's like we take that spotlight of God's word and we shine it off of ourselves and we put it on other people. So that way, when we, when we are convicted and we're like, oh, I know I messed up, but look at that guy over there. And we point the finger. We point the spotlight. We point God's word at other people and we convict them. We condemn them so that we feel better about our sin. The third response that we can do is we can confess our sin like David finally does. This passage of Scripture, 2 Samuel chapter 12, is not meant to be a passage of condemnation and judgment, but it's meant to be a passage of hope. Hope for David, a man who was so stuck in his sin, so stuck in his deceit and his lies and his wickedness, buried under the weight of his own sin. And God took him and dealt with the sin and rescued him. <clears throat> God took him and gave him hope. And that is what you and I have today, hope. His name is Jesus. No matter where we're at in life, no matter what we may be struggling with or suffering through, we have hope in Christ. Hope that we can be delivered from our flesh, delivered from the bondage of sin, delivered from the eternal result of our sin. Escaping from hell and delivered into heaven all because Jesus became a man. He died on the cross to bear our sins. In John 3, 16 and 17, it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Our sin has been paid for, but before we can receive that grace, that forgiveness, we have to first recognize that we've sinned. We have to first say, I have sinned against the Lord. You see, Jesus says in Luke chapter 5, verses 31 and 32, Jesus answered and said to them, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. We can't receive God's grace, God's forgiveness, until we first say, I have sinned against the Lord. It's the first step we make in becoming a Christian. And if you've not put your faith in Jesus yet, don't wait any longer. Do so today. Come to Jesus. Put your faith in him and let your sins be paid for and forgiven. But even for those of us who have been Christians for years, it's an attitude of recognizing I have sinned against the Lord, but he has paid for my sin. He has given me mercy and grace. He has given me hope where I felt hopeless. One final thought. When David sinned with Bathsheba, he first ignored the conviction of his own conscience. Obviously, he knew what he did was wrong. That's why he tried to hide it, right? He also ignored the conviction of the Holy Spirit. But finally, when Nathan the prophet was sent to him, he repented. He confessed his sin. God will often be gracious enough to give us multiple opportunities to repent and turn away from our sin. But eventually those opportunities will run out. Every time we choose not to come to Jesus, not to come to the Lord, that may well be our very last opportunity because we're not guaranteed a single day extra in this life. You're guaranteed your, your past, but your future we don't know. And so don't wait. Come to Jesus, let him love you and pay for your sin. Let's pray. God, we thank you so much that you can look at a man like David, a thief, a liar, a murderer, an adulterer, and yet, Lord, you love him. Lord, I thank you that you can look, a man, look at a man like me a man of sin, of wickedness, of selfishness, of pride. Lord, my heart is wicked, and yet, Lord, you love me. God, we praise you that you do not leave us stuck in our own sin, but, Lord, you give us a door of escape. You give us 
yourself. Lord, thank you so much that you died on the cross to pay for our sin. Thank you that you've opened up the door of salvation for any who would believe in you. God, we pray that you would please help us to know how great your love is for us. Help us to know how amazing your forgiveness is. Lord, I thank you that you can take men and women like us, not only paying for our sin, but then, Lord, blessing us, giving us things we don't deserve. God, we do ask that you would, in each of our lives, make less of ourselves and make more of you. God, we ask that you would please bring glory to your name in and through each of our lives, just as you did with David. Lord, help us to be men and women after your own heart, not because we don't sin, but, Lord, because when we do sin, we come to you. God, thank you for your grace. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your love. God, we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.